All right, let's start with our script 1A in the flood mapping module. We're going to work with this data set called Sentinel-1, which is a public domain SAR data set that is available to us to use. It's uh, very useful for mapping floods. So the target for this module is we're going to select a region and figure out which pixels were affected by flood. And the way we're going to structure the code is we'll have some data flooding where you know we knew that this area was flooded. We're going to take some images before the flooding, we'll take some images after the flooding, figure out which pixels changed, so which was not flooded and which is now flooded. And then we can compare and figure out uh, all the areas that were flooded. We'll also apply some techniques to remove pixels, which are false detections. We'll remove permanent water and stuff that is you know cannot be flooded pixels. And then we can come up with a more robust detection of flood. And then we can compute the area of the flood. This is very uh, widely used in flood mapping because most of the time flood is accompanied with heavy rainfall. So optical sensors like Landsat and Sentinel, you will not have cloud-free observations, especially post floods. So for rapid response and determining the flood extent, you can rely on SAR data. Let's see how uh, this data set is used. This data set is called Sentinel-1 SAR. Uh, SAR stands for Synthetic Aperture Data. GRD stands for Ground Rains Detected. Sentinel-1, uh, when you have the raw data, it can be processed in multiple ways and you get different products. There are two main products that the Sentinel-1 satellite generates. One is called SLC, which is Single Look single look complex and another is GRD. SLC data is widely used in SAR interferometry. SLC data can be used to determine you know, very small changes in elevation. It's used to derive a very accurate elevation maps. You can derive damage from earthquakes and ground changes and so on. Very useful data, but in Earth Engine, you cannot load SLC data. Uh, the way Earth Engine is structured, SLC data has complex numbers as pixel values. Earth Engine cannot handle that yet. So SLC data is widely requested uh, because it's very painful to work with this data in other software. But in Earth Engine, yet, you cannot use SLC data, so you cannot do SAR interferometry. But the other data, GRD data, where you don't remove that phase information, you remove the complex numbers, and you create a georeference graded data set, uh, which is has the backscatter value as pixels, those are available in Earth Engine and you can use that. So that's a GRD data set, data set that we'll be working with. Sentinel-1 is the name of the mission consisting of two satellites, Sentinel-1A and 1B. Uh, this is a constellation. Unfortunately, Sentinel-1B uh, had a failure uh, a couple of years back, and so it's offline currently. So currently in the constellation, there's only one A. Sentinel-1C was supposed to launch last year. There were some launch problems, it could not launch. And finally, the currently Sentinel-1C is planned to launch in March of this year. So fingers crossed, once the Sentinel-1C goes, we'll be back with two satellites. And then once Sentinel-1B goes on, we'll have three satellites. But right now, there's only one, sensor, one satellite operational for this. The radar uh, frequencies can be in different bands. So in this data set is in C band. And again, they have different properties. It is a shorter wavelength. It can not penetrate very deep underground. There are other wavelengths which can go much further underground. So SAR can also look at stuff that is underground because it can penetrate ground. Uh, this C band SAR cannot go much further. I think it can go only a few centimeters below the ground. The biggest advantage of SAR is that the satellite has its own energy source. It is uh, transmitting those radar pulses, it doesn't need sun. So it, it is operational both day and night. That means you can get observations both in ascending and descending orbits. When you have a satellite, a typical satellite, uh, uh, and this is the Earth, when the satellite is orbiting the Earth, it is going like this. Typically, most satellites will capture data in the descending orbit. When it's going down, the sun is here, the sun is here, it is looking at all the sunlit pixels as it's going down, and it's observing and downloading uh, on capturing data when it's ascending when it's coming back up. That's the time where it uh, data is downloaded from the satellite using the ground stations. It's not capturing because it's night there. There's nothing to see. And when it comes up, again, it starts capturing the data. Uh, SAR data, Sentinel-1 doesn't need sun, so it captures data both in descending and ascending orbits. So many times you'll see you'll filter the data for one day, 
and you will have an observation in the morning and night, same day, because it has captured this data at night as well. So again, you, send, uh, you can have both day and night capability. Also, it can doesn't get affected by clouds or haze. So it can penetrate clouds, and that means even if there were clouds, it can see what's going on. So uh, you can have an all weather 24 seven observation capabilities with this satellite. The spatial resolution is 10 meters. So that's also pretty good. You have a, a very high resolution observation for the ground and you get this uh, data at 10 meter resolution. Again, here, the resolution is doesn't mean exactly that you'll be able to distinguish objects at 10 meter. The pixel size is 10 meters. You'll see what you can see from this 10 meter. Temporal resolution with the constellation of two satellites, you can get data at six day interval over Europe and 12 days for the rest of the world. It's a European satellite, so it's configured to collect more data over Europe. Right now, since Sentinel 1B is down, you get data, one data every 24 days. This is currently a big gap in a lot of the flood response and disaster response because if there was a flooding today, you may have to wait up to 24 days for a new image. It used to be 12 days, but now it is uh, 24 days. So hopefully with the Sentinel 1C in operation, we'll have will be back to the six to 12 day observation. SAR signal can be sent in horizontal or vertical polarization. And you can measure the signal that's coming back in either of the direction. So depending on what is measured, you can say this was the backscatter in HH, HB, VB, and VH. HH means it was sent in a horizontal polarization, received in a horizontal polarization, and this was the amount of backscatter that was measured. So in your Sentinel images, you will have bands named HH, HV, VV, and VH. And you can use, select the bands that you want to work with and see the, the, reflect, see the backscatter in those orientations. Sentinel-1 measures most of the Earth's surface into either VV or VH. So unless you are in a polar region or a specific small region, most of the images will be having VV and VH bands of your data. For this class, since we are interested in water, uh, most of the science says that if you want to detect open water, like surface water, VH is the better band. The open water is more clearly seen in VH band. So that's what is generally used for all flood mapping. But again, you can try and experiment with different things. One more thing uh, we need to learn is that the satellite has different operational modes there's an IW mode, EW mode, and SM mode. Again, over different parts of the world, the satellite configuration changes, and you can capture data in a small, uh, in a high resolution or kind of regular resolution. Again, most of the world is captured in IW mode. So unless you're working with kind of smaller islands or polar regions, you will be dealing with IW data. This is important because as you work with Sentinel-1 collection, it is unlike other collections in our Sentinel. If you look at Sentinel-2 collection, every image has the same bands, and the same resolution. In Sentinel-1 collection, you will have some images which have only VV and VH bands. Some images will have only HH and HV bands. Some images will be at 10 meter resolution, some images will be in five meter resolution and so on. So you need to understand this to figure out which images we'll be using for your particular project. There's a question to explain interferometry in SAR. Uh, that is out of scope for this class since you cannot do interferometry in Earth Engine. Uh, I will link to some material. I myself am not an expert in interferometry. I've only seen and uh, seen the output of interferometry and he have heard other people talk about it. I've not personally used it, so I'm not the expert in interferometry. Back to our script. Let's uh, see visually what this SAR data looks like. We're going to do flood mapping, so we have defined uh, some dates. Uh, this we are trying to map floods that happened in India. One of the worst flooding events in India in the recent past, August 2018, there were floods in the southern part of India. So we have defined this four dates. The flooding, the peak flooding happened around 10th of August, right? So, or sorry, 16th of August. So we captured this date saying that we want to find images between these dates. So we define anything before 10th of August as a pre-flood because the rain started around 10th of August. 
So if you want to see what was the situation pre-flood, we'll look at these images. And then this is the post-flood event that the floods were triggered by rainfall. So we'll find some images between that. And uh, again, when you're doing your flooding exercise, you can do a similar thing. You want to find the post-flood image as close to the peak flooding as possible. So you can detect all flood pixels. And the pre-flood would be much further in the past where you know there was no rainfall or no flooding. We also selected the, the district, uh, one of the districts which was affected by this flood. And we want to map all the flooded pixels within the region throughout this time period. So let's start working with the Sentinel-1 data. We will search Sentinel-1. And you can see this match here, Sentinel-1 SARS GRD. There is some information about the pre-processing that this data set has gone through. So our engine team takes the raw data, runs it through some of the corrections that were needed to use it. So it's mostly ready to use, but again, we'll learn about some additional processes that needs to happen. You will get an image which has got two or more of these bands available. So you have HH, HB, VB, VH, et cetera. So let's import this data. So we'll take this collection. This will be our S1 collection and we'll filter it. So start here. I'll just say the collection is take S1 and we'll apply some filters. So we'll just do a basic date and location filter for now. So we'll say, give me all Sentinel-1 images collected between this date. We'll say this was before flooding happened and within this region. Let's print the result, see if we get any matches. So it says there were three images that were matched and these three images were collected in 16th of July, 28th of July and 9th of August. Each image has these bands. We have VB band, VH band, and angle band. Angle band is the incidence angle. That is the, the angle at which the signal uh, was sent to the ground. And some analysis will require that angle. For most of our purpose, we don't care about angle. We just care about the backscatter in VB or VH bands. We have three images. Let's just look at one of them just to see what SAR image looks like. So I'm just going to take this collection and or dot first on it. Just give me one image so I can see it. Let's cast it to e dot image. So no, it's an image. And let's print it. So we got one image out of the collection from this time period over our region. This image has these three bands. Let's look at one of the bands. I'm going to look at the image in the VH band. So I'm going to use the select function. And select the VH band and add it to the map. And again, we have not specified the visual parameters. So we can black. Let's zoom into some region and let's inspect some pixel values just to see what those pixels look like. If I inspect the pixel value. I get values like minus 19, minus 12, minus 13, what are these values? Why they are negative and why they are in this range? So let's understand what do these pixel values of the Sentinel image represent. The pixel values of the SAR image represent the signal backscatter. So remember the way what we're looking at is there was a signal sent to the ground, it got scattered, and some came back to the sensor. Whatever came back to the sensor, we are measuring the amplitude of the signal, how how high was the signal? And that amplitude is what is represented in the pixel values. So the pixel value represents the amplitude square, which is the intensity. So the pixel value is the intensity of the backscatter signal that was measured at the satellite. So the lower the values, that means very few <clears throat> amount of signal came back. So the surface was very smooth and everything went away. SAR images are always oblique images. They're never looking down because you want to measure what comes back. So you look at the surface from an angle, send the signal and see what comes back. If it was very smooth surface, everything will go away. If it was a rough surface, some of it will come back. So the typical amount of backscatter intensity that comes back is between zero to 0 0.5. So 
remember the intensity of the pixel values is 0 to 0 0.5. This is not minus 12 or minus 13, that's what we see in the image. This is the raw data which is available in Earth Engine in this collection called Copernicus S1 GRD flow. This is the raw data which is again, uh, you need to process it to use it. Most analysts do not want this. You need to process it and convert it to a different unit before you can use this. So you take this backscatter intensity and convert it into the unit of decibel, dB. These values are called sigma naught. Most of the analysis that you do, you need to have sigma naught as your backscatter value. The formula is this. You take the intensity, take log value, and multiply it by 10. That's what you get as your backscatter amplitude in decibels. You get values between minus 30 to 0. And that's what we are looking at. The pixel values in our collection, in the S1 GRD collection, are typically between minus 30 to 0. And that's the backscatter intensity in decibel. Let's first look at the image and then we can see how to interpret this. So now we have some idea of the min max value that we are looking at. We will define our risk balance. Min minus 30, max zero. And now we see something that represents an image. Let's zoom in to see what looks like. Comparing to our base map, you can see it kind of matches what we see, right? We have water bodies, which are very dark. Why is water very dark? Well, smooth water, water or steady water is very smooth. So almost no signal came back. The values are very low. So if I inspect the water pixel here, let me inspect this water pixel. Minus 24, very low value. There are structures such as buildings. So you can see this is an area with a lot of buildings here buildings with metal roof, slanted roof, will have a large backscatter value. So if I inspect this, almost zero. It's a very high value, right? So what you're looking at is how, what is the structure of the surface? If it's smooth, it will have low values. If it's, you know, something there that is reflecting the signal, that'd be high value. Let's quickly do the exercise and then we'll cover the rest of the scripts tomorrow.